This is my third time coming to this conference, and I come to be inspired, and I come to be renewed, and yet again, this year has been just incredible, and I think you can all agree with that. Wonderful speakers, wonderful panels, but also learning from each other. And now we have a final treat, Dr. Jeffrey Sachs. Now, I've heard Dr. Sachs described as one of the world's most passionate development economists. Now, this is the only time I think I've ever heard passionate and economist put together in the same phrase. So this is really going to be interesting. Now, you've all no doubt read his bio already in your materials, but for those of you who might be a little behind in your reading, Dr. Sachs is the director of the Earth Institute, professor of sustainable development, and professor of health policy and management at Columbia University. Over the past two decades, he's become internationally known for pushing government, business, and civil society to work together to stamp out hyperinflation and institute sustainable economic and institutional reforms. He served as an economic advisor in Poland, Russia, and Bolivia, where his accomplishments earned him recognition as one of the world's most important thinkers on globalization. But Dr. Sachs is perhaps best known today for his keen sense of universal human values and his tireless advocacy on behalf of the poor, the diseased, and the dispossessed. We are indeed honored that he could be with us this year. Dr. Jeffrey Sachs. Thank you so much. I want to savor, uh, savor this moment a little bit to be in a room with all of you because a couple of days ago I was in a room with Roger Noriega and it's not as much fun. Uh, I was testifying in the banking, in the uh, foreign relations uh, committee about Haiti and indeed about uh, the very frightening developments in our country and um, it really is uh, worth uh, any day flying across this country to sit in a room to remember how wonderful this country is and how wonderful people like you are to have the vision and the dedication and the generosity and the insight to do the great things that you're doing. And I'm very grateful for the chance to speak with you for a few minutes. I can't cover all of the complex topics that you've been debating and discussing, obviously. I can't give a fitting wrap up in that sense. But I do want to talk about uh, one part of our common quest in this room and the part that inherently is the the voiceless part in the world except when you help to give them voice. And that is the, the plight of the poorest of the poor in the world. Roughly speaking, the bottom billion people in the world. The people that I describe as living in extreme poverty, which can be paraphrased as the poverty that kills. Here we are in the year 2004, in the middle of the greatest technological and scientific explosion of capacity and knowledge, of course, that humanity could ever have imagined and has ever produced more wealth, literally, than we know what to do with sometimes. And yet, hundreds of millions of people are at risk of death at any day because of their extreme impoverishment. A couple of weeks ago, on behalf of the Secretary General, I was taken by the most wonderful and inspiring and beleaguered Minister of Health of Kenya, Minister Charity Ngilu, to a district hospital outside of Nairobi, Kitui District Hospital. This is the one hospital, not as you would imagine it, I'll describe it in a moment, but it's the one hospital for 700,000 people in the Kitui district of eastern Kenya. It is a ramshackle set of buildings, 
without running water. Patients bring buckets of water. You know Semmelweis 150 years ago made a good observation that washing hands can keep patients alive. You can't wash hands without running water. There was one operating table for general surgery for 700,000 people. And the attending medical officer in charge begged me to send a full surgical kit to the hospital. We walked the wards. Three women had lost their children that day to malaria. Not because they didn't have medicine, incidentally, but because the medicine that is the so-called first-line medicine, a sulfa-based uh, drug uh, that is known as Fanzadar, is no longer effective because of drug resistance. But the donors have not seen fit yet to help provide the financing to introduce an effective drug, uh, which would be a combination therapy based on artemisinin, because that would be $1 a dose rather than the 5 cents a dose, the logic being that Fanzadar doesn't work, but at least it's cheap. So three women lost their children that day, and the pediatric ward was filled with children in cerebral malaria. They were going to go home without insecticide-impregnated bed nets, which could have protected those villages with repeated clinical trials showing a 50% or more all-cause child mortality reduction simply by sleeping under an insecticide-impregnated bed net. But they were going to go home without bed nets even after a bout of life-threatening malaria if the children survive because the aid agencies have seen fit to socially market the bed nets, it's called, to try to sell bed nets to people that have nothing. And a private uh, survey confirmed what I've been writing about for years and many others. I published something with colleagues last year in Lancet that the uh, PSI, one of the uh, NGOs that's implementing the USAID DFID bed net policy has had no success whatsoever in increasing the use of bed nets in rural areas of Kenya because families can't pay three or four dollars for a bed net. So this is what extreme poverty is. Just to finish, by the way, because I can't pass up the chance to tell you. I got into the car after uh, seeing two hospitals, Machak, and we went to another district, Machakos District Hospital, and I got into the car to go back to Nairobi, and uh, Charity asked me to come out again. And she had uh, draped under her arm a very forlorn-looking little girl about the age of my youngest daughter. And this girl was staring down at the ground, would not look up to me, would not smile. And Charity, the health minister, explained that this girl has been on the ward for three months. Why three months? Well, because a successful procedure was done three months earlier, but the parents could not pay for her discharge. This you couldn't even imagine in Dickens. It seems so surrealistic to me. I asked again, are you serious? And she explained exactly the situation. I said, I want to go pay for the girl right now to be released. It was something like $250. So I said, please call the comptroller of the hospital. And the comptroller came out and um, was very nervous to see his minister of health there uh, and uh, mumbled something that, no, no, that's not our policy in this hospital and uh, with the girls standing there, so uh, even comptrollers can be as surrealistic as the U.S. government is on Haiti. Uh, and uh, the health minister said, I want this girl discharged immediately. And the girl was 
And uh, the, the, the comptroller incidentally said, well, it's Sunday afternoon, uh, we'll discharge her tomorrow. And this being a very experienced and tough-minded woman said, no, no, she'll go right now and she'll go in my car and I'll wait here for an hour. And indeed, a crowd of about 150 people had gathered around by that time and went into a whooping cheer. And the girl got into the car and the health minister waited as her car went away. Then she turned to me and said, when I complained about this policy coming into office, a senior World Bank official went to the president to say that I was undermining the financial integrity of the health system of Kenya by inciting people not to pay their bills. Now, the last thing that we did that day, because as the representative of the Secretary General, I was there not only to bear witness and to see and to try to understand, but to try to do something about that. We had detailed discussions with the government. And it transpired that not only is there a profound shortage of doctors in the health sector, 11 doctors for 700,000, 14 doctors, excuse me, for, nope, I'll get it right, 12 doctors, sorry, in Katui District for 700,000 people, about one and a half doctors on average per 100,000 people. That's a, that's a long waiting list to see a doctor. That means most people live and die without ever seeing a doctor, of course. Not only was there this shortage, and then I would no doubt go home and hear my government talk about lack of absorptive capacity and inability to scale up and to do other things, the fact of the matter is that under the IMF World Bank financially supervised program, they had laid off 5,000 health workers because they didn't have the money within their own budget to provide for them, and nobody was helping them from the donor world. So I've now asked for a complete accounting, and I have a $58 million exact accounting, district by district, by the way, of the nurses, the doctors, the medical officers in charge, the clinical workers, and so forth, that would be needed to bring back the trained health workers that are not servicing the people of Kenya right now, whose life expectancy has plummeted in the last 15 years, not only because of the AIDS pandemic, but because of the surge of malaria under the burden of multiple drug-resistant plasmodium falciparum. Let me just share with you another, another vignette, just to give you the flavor of what extreme, extreme poverty is. In an earlier visit a couple months ago in, in uh, Ethiopia, we went from Addis Ababa to a project, agriculture project in a region called Nazareth, outside of the city of Nazareth, which is about, uh, oh, about a three and a half hour ride from Addis. And we went to see an absolutely impoverished region with a man behind a bullock pulling a, a plow uh, that was, uh, you, you would have recognized from biblical times, literally. And I, through the translator, through the agricultural extension officer, asked the man, rather innocently, I was making agronomic small talk, I thought, uh, and I said, uh, so you take the manure of your oxen and you apply it to the fields. And he said, oh, no, no, we can't do that anymore. We have to use the manure for cooking because there are no trees left. So there's no more fuel wood. And we just cook with the manure. So there's, aside from everything else, no fuel wood uh, and uh, no fertilizer put on the fields. Now, this is a country of 70 million people, life expectancy about 42 years. Three doctors per 100,000 on average, almost all in Addis if they're not in the United States by now, and still being counted. Now, they too had tabled and have tabled a scaled up health program that is really ingenious, actually, because the prime minister is quite ingenious in my view. They can't get it funded right now because, because nobody can get anything funded right now, to put it 
starkly. Now, what is going on here? I advised the Secretary General on these Millennium Development Goals. These are the world's commitments to do something about this situation. To cut poverty by half by the year 2015, and in my professional judgment, and it's a rigorous one, I think, to end absolute poverty by the year 2025. It may sound fanciful, and it uh, runs uh, against the grain of people's thinking, but it's actually absolutely straightforward. Why is it straightforward? Well, those $58 million for Kenya, for example, would be six cents from every person in the rich world if we wanted to do that. So when you start scaling what is possible and what can be done and so forth, it turns out, as I'll stress, it's not all that tricky because we actually are in 2004. We've done a good job on quantum electrodynamics. We understand a lot about uh, how to mobilize energy. Uh, we understand a lot about, uh, about genomics and uh, proteomics and, and uh, other ways to uh, develop uh, new drugs. We, we know a lot, actually. We actually know how to triple yields of that smallholder in Ethiopia, either through agroforestry or by applying fertilizer. It's actually not beyond the ken to solve these problems. And a funny thing happened in 2000 when the world's leaders said, well, we'll do this. You know, let's have a civilized start to the new millennium something that has now been lost. But we, the world said we'd have a civilized start so that by the year 2015, goals that had failed in the past will really meet them this time. Now, it's important not to oversimplify what's uh, happening in a very complex world. And if I had a semester of lectures, I'd love to share with you my thoughts about that. And what I tell you is that in some places in the world, there really is very rapid poverty reduction. And globalization is not an evil process, actually. Uh, there's a lot of progress in China and in India and in uh, other places in uh, hundreds of millions of people escaping poverty. But it's also critical not to overgeneralize. If you happen to be in the highlands or in rural Africa, globalization is not reaching you. It's not that you're exploited by multinationals. You're actually ignored by the world, and you're dying for many complicated reasons, whether it's drug-resistant malaria or soils that no longer have nutrients and fertilizer that's too expensive, and other cycles of impoverishment where families are too impoverished even to produce enough food to feed themselves, and their girls never get to school because they have to walk 10 kilometers each day to fetch the fuel, wood, and the water. It's just so extreme that the situation isn't getting better on its own, but too slowly. It's getting worse on its own and dramatically fast. And then come the visitations of AIDS and increasing drug-resistant malaria and increasing episodes of drought, probably due to an amplified ENSO cycle. That is the uh, El Nino Southern Oscillation Cycle, which through teleconnections is pounding Africa repeatedly with drought in the last 15 years. And so we have a significant part of the world, about 500 million people in Africa in the most desperate state on the whole planet. And we have other significant regions of extreme poverty, the Andean region, which is virtually in explosion now large parts of Central Asia, where the problems are not the Taliban. The problems are extreme impoverishment in regions that are remote, typically arid, typically isolated, and almost always utterly impoverished. Well, the world said we do something about this. And here's the funny thing about it, ladies and gentlemen. The poor countries actually heard that. We visited this last week four countries, the whole leadership of this UN Millennium Project, which I direct for the Secretary General. We went to Senegal, to Ghana, Kenya, and Ethiopia. We met with the national leadership, with civil society, 
with the United Nations country agencies and with the official donor community. The message that I bring back is it's four countries. They are not representative. I chose four countries that in many ways are already providing important leadership. These are four countries that have their act together. They have their act together so much that they are way ahead of the game, if one could call it that, vis-a-vis -vis us in the rich world. So what's happened is they heard a call, make poverty reduction plans. They thought about it. They tabled them. They said, we want our girls in school. We want our children to have health care. We'd like to pave roads. We, too, believe in electricity. And I have read through thousands of pages in, in my work, and in the last uh, couple of weeks, at least 1,000 pages of these so-called poverty reduction strategies. In Senegal, it's called a PRSP, and in Ghana, it's the GPRS, and in Kenya, it's the ERS. WC, the Economic Recovery Strategy and Wealth Creation, uh, and in uh, Ethiopia, it's the program on PSDRP or something, I'm sorry. Uh, it's the Program on Sustainable Development and uh, Poverty Reduction, PR. These are actually extremely thoughtful programs. And what happened in every one of the countries is the donors kind of scratched their heads and said, oh, well, if that's a lot of money you need. So that when Ghana, which is an undeniably multi-party democracy, peaceful and impoverished, tabled their Ghana poverty reduction strategy, their GPRS, they said we need eight billion dollars over five years of help and then we could break free of poverty. It's not so crazy because the United States advocated 55 billion over four years for Iraq from the world. But the Ghanaians were told you must be, you must be mistaken, will you think again? And it came down to six in the second round, then four in the third round, and the official program, which was voted by the World Bank a couple of weeks ago, is $2 billion. Now, what that is, $2 billion, is a fake. It's not a poverty reduction strategy. It's the complex motions of an international system where the rich world doesn't mean it. And that's what we see throughout Africa and throughout many parts of the world. Haiti, parenthetically, had all its multilateral aid frozen by the Bush administration from the first day of this administration coming to power. And they deliberately and knowingly broke the back of the government because Roger Noriega the former staffer of Jesse Helms just didn't like Aristide. And they found a plane to charter to help solve that problem. But the more general problem is that while there are known approaches and solutions, they are not being applied. Now I want to turn to you as colleagues, strat fellow strategists in this, to help figure out what we can do about this. I have one word for what I do every day. And you basically, I think, have one concern for what you do. The word that I have in front of me every day is scale. I know about the pilot projects all over the world that show that you can get girls in school, you can triple food productivity on soil nutrient-depleted farm plots of Africa. 
You can save children from malaria. You can treat people with AIDS. You can bring safe drinking water and sanitation. You can end the lives of women in the poorest places as beasts of burden who spend virtually all of their day carrying vast loads of water and fuel wood to stay alive and to help their families stay alive. We have pilots, many of which you funded over the years, that have proved all of these things repeatedly. For me as a macroeconomist, having seen this on a professional basis in probably about 80 countries in the world now, the issue is scale, not the mystery of what to do. There are thugocracies, there are despotisms where the issues are political, no doubt. But there's a great part of the world where the issues are simple economics, people that are too poor to stay alive, and by being so poor they have no surplus to save, and having no surplus and facing growing problems of deforestation, environmental degradation, falling crop yields, rising populations, we see disaster rather than Millennium Development Goals. But the solutions are not so hard in those cases. They are the solutions of paving roads, building schools, providing bed nets, helping with agroforestry approaches to soil nutrients. And I could go on and you and I together could easily write down a list of 50 sensible interventions that would turn places from poverty trap to self-sustaining economic development. But they cost money. And the money's not there. And everything else without that is faking it. And the United States, since Ronald Reagan, through George I, through Bill Clinton, I'm sorry to say, and now into this administration, created an elaborate mechanism by which the international community in very sophisticated ways explains to the poor why it's their own fault. And if they would just, if people would just get serious and learn how to govern themselves properly, that they too could get out of poverty. And it's cruel, and it's wrong, and it's not working, and it's not making us safer. And the terrible thing for me is how easy it would be not only to make us safer, but how easy it would be to solve these problems, and not solve them once, to solve them once and for all. Because that's how close we are how rich and capable we are in the world to actually ending these scourges. I'm not talking about bringing utopia or even bringing wealth to these people. I'm talking about bringing a state of affairs in a well-defined period so that people are not dying of their extreme poverty. That is within our grasp if we make those investments. So for me, the word is scale. What's the word for you, in my opinion? It's leverage. How can you leverage, lever, what you are doing to create global solutions? I've had the opportunity many times to say to Bill Gates, even you, Bill, can't do it by yourself. You get a frizzin of excitement saying that. <laughs> and it's actually true. Bill Gates, who's made the most extraordinary single contribution of our time, the largest single contribution in history in absolute terms, has taken on global public health. 
It's magnificent what he's done. It's historic and it's path-breaking. But it's only leverage if it's going to work. And the reason I say it is that when I chaired a commission for the World Health Organization, the Commission on Macroeconomics and Health, where we made a detailed assessment of what it would take, we found that what was needed was about 10 cents on every $100 of rich world income. 10 cents. We get to keep the $999.90 and, uh, $99 and, 90 cents and uh, give 10 cents of our income to the poor, that would save, by the estimates of the Commission, about 8 million lives a year. But that amount is about $25 billion a year. And the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is spending about $800 million a year, not $25 billion a year, on global public health. So that gives you a sense of the leverage that he needs. He needs a leverage of 30 to 1. And he's not getting it right now. So we need to figure out how to lever your incredible leadership and generosity and vision. I just need about an hour more. <laughs> it's OK. I was getting around to my main theme. We need ways to lever your vision and reach scale. Now, just one bit of arithmetic. On how to democratize philanthropy, I have an idea. It's called taxation. Yeah. Let me give you a quick outline of what is probably orders of magnitude on the macro, macro scale, and then I'll come down to, down to uh, our concerns here in, in the room. On the macro scale, we probably need to double development assistance and direct it wisely and honestly to the poorest countries of the world in order to be able to achieve the Millennium Development Goals. It's certainly less than tripling aid. It's but it's more than doubling. That's for the whole world. Aid, as measured right now, is about $57 billion a year from all donors to all recipients. Only a fraction of that goes to the poorest countries, of course. Our estimates in the UN Millennium Project are that we probably require an extra 60 to $90 billion per year between now and the year 2015 to get this job done. That would save millions of lives, bring hundreds of millions of people out of impoverishment, dignify the lives of hundreds of millions of people. It's simply the best damn bargain in the history of the world is what it is. But we're not getting there right now because the biggest single hole in the entire international system is us, is the United States taxpayers. Our development assistance is 0.13 of 1% of GNP against the international norm of 0.7% of GNP. We're just $57 billion short of where we ought to be per year. But we know that's not so hard to get. We got $87 billion in a snap of a finger. We gave away $250 billion of tax cuts per year. We raised military spending by $150 billion annual rate in the last three years. And then the President comes with his Millennium Challenge account. It's $1 billion. And it hasn't gotten started yet. We're $13 billion of development assistance. We are $450 billion of military spending right now if one wants to understand why we're out of kilter, why we're flying in a plane that is listing so dangerously over that we are 
seriously a risk of crashing as a country in the world. So if you want to know where scale is going to come from, it's going to come from us. From stopping to fake or pretend that we're doing what we can do, all that we can do, while teachers and doctors are dying untreated of disease and are being laid off because of IMF World Bank supervised programs. And what Jim told us, when the public finds out about these things, they're not so hostile to this. They really aren't. They're shocked by it. Now, what can you do as leaders? Let me mention quickly six things. This is not exhaustive, and I hope not exhausting also. First, you can champion an innovation. There are specific things that can change the world. An anti-malaria bed net has now been proven repeatedly that it can change the world if it's used in a village. It can reduce all-cause child mortality by 50% or more in holoendemic malarious regions. For small amounts of money, you could take on programs like this. But the point that I would stress is not that you're going to end malaria that way or even end it, uh, end it in these places, but rather that by taking on these innovations, you become champions of a demonstration of what can be done. Because as important and wonderful as the results on the ground, you always have to think, how can this reach scale? Not through me, because I've done what I can do, but how can it reach scale through the world understanding what is possible in the year 2004? Paul Farmer, my dear friend who treats patients in the central plateau of Haiti and who is heartbroken and crestfallen and shocked and alarmed by the events of the last few days, just decided to treat patients with AIDS before anyone gave him permission. Even more than that, not only did he get volunteer drugs, I have a feeling, and he's kind of admitted, that he pilfered some of those along the way as well so that his patients could stay alive. Now, he brought people down, including myself. I took his results to the Secretary General and elsewhere and helped. I wrote the plan for the global, the first draft for the Secretary General of the Global Fund for AIDS, TB, and Malaria. And Paul's project was a demonstration that this can be done. It had an incredible effect on the whole world. One clinic in Kanj, Haiti. So champion in innovation. And give me a call. I can tell you lots of them that are desperately needed. Malaria bed nets, agroforestry to increase the nitrogen in the soils, multi-platform energy sources for off-grid remote rural areas that would save the time of mothers and women all over the impoverished world, school meals programs with locally produced food to get girls in school and to help the farming community locally, women's community organizations, which many of you are supporting, which are enormously important, IT-enabled education and health care. There are many specific innovations which, when proved, can become the basis for scale and generalization and advocacy. Second, champion a cause. Look what Rotary has done with polio. Look what Bill Gates has done with vaccines. Malaria is a disease killing three million children each year that has no leadership right now. It is attackable. It's controllable. It is not utterly subject to eradication or elimination, but it can be brought decisively under control. We need leaders for that. Education for all is floundering despite international commitments. Three, champion an institution like Ed Scott has done with Friends of the Global Fund to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria. They are so desperately short of cash they can't even see straight. 
The WHO has no friends, it seems. Just a budget squeeze from the United States government as reckless as anything we're squeezing in a world of emerging and re-emerging diseases, the core budget of the World Health Organization and in the midst of the AIDS pandemic and resurgent malaria and TB has been frozen for the last 12 years because the UN is a waste of time for Americans. So champion an institution. Boy, would WHO love friends. And does it need them? As do many other UN agencies, which, from my experience, all over the world are incredibly professional, filled with knowledgeable people, and people as frustrated as you and I. Fourth, of course, advocate for U.S. leadership. Our country is in a very bad shape right now. And we have to pull ourselves back to health. And the illness of our body politic, I think, has never been so bad as it is today in recent decades. I can't vouch for, I say it's, well, I won't go into it. I'll skip the politics. We are failing as a country to lead, as you know. We are failing on precise, specific targets that we've signed repeatedly, including in the Monterey Summit on Investment for Development, we signed a Monterey consensus whose paragraph 42, which you can download on the internet easily, says we urge all developed countries that have not done so to make concrete efforts towards the target of 0.7% of GNP in official development assistance. President Bush apparently read that and thought that concrete efforts meant going from 0.12 to 0.13. This is the greatest obstacle to reducing global poverty on the whole planet is the lack of the U.S. role. Cities are getting organized. The Seattle Initiative for Global Development is a wonderful example of local organization. And they're working with other cities to spur similar efforts. We need a civic movement in this country. And people can understand that $450 billion for the military and $13 billion for development assistance cannot be the way to make us safe. They can understand that. And we need to help them understand what the choices are. Fifth, and added as I was listening to uh, Jim Fishkin in his remarkable work, we need processes, I would say, not only of deliberative polling, but also of deliberative decision making and consensus building along the lines that he's been advocating and championing for so many years. You do bring people together in a room, they will change their views. If we bring the leadership, not only of the philanthropies, but of the large corporations, government agencies, scientists, that need to be at the table also, because much of this is science-based that we're talking about. NGOs, environmental groups, this country could actually reach a consensus on issues that seem so divisive right now that they seem beyond consensus, but it's not true. Like you, I travel all over this country. I speak to an incredible number of groups. There is a basis for consensus in this country. But it has to be done on the basis of deliberation and having the facts at hand and explaining, discussing, respecting each other. And this is something that the philanthropic world could help to promote. If we get the heads of, heads of ExxonMobil in the room with the Environmental Defense Fund and others, and with the scientists that do global change, and with General Motors, which is wondering what's going on to our market in 20 years, 
Do we need fuel cells or not? Do we have to care about carbon? We could actually reach a consensus on a sensible, responsible national course on climate change. We could do the same thing on development assistance. You could help to spur such a deliberative process. It could play a vital role in our democratic life. We are not as divided as this administration has made us seem. Finally and specifically, I want to invite at least some of you, one or more of you, and this is without any, uh, I have no permission to say what I'm about to say, but I think it's important. I would appeal to some of you to help support the Secretary General directly in his work on the Millennium Development Goals. This is a desperate, desperate need. He individually, Kofi Annan, is, I think, our world's most remarkable politician. It's my greatest honor to be working at his side. But more than that, institutionally, the United Nations is our hope for peace. It truly is. Of all the shocks of recent years, the outright hostility of the United States to that institution is perhaps the most grotesque of all. Although there are lots of candidates, I have to say. <laughs> we need a civil, global process. The United Nations is vital to that. The Secretary General is, he is the focus institutionally in very deep ways from the Millennium Declaration itself, which he tabled to the world, to the upcoming, upcoming summit next year, to the processes of the UN country teams within every poor country in the world. He is the institutional locus, and he is the representative of the global hopes to reduce and eventually eliminate extreme poverty. I can tell you on personal reflection, it was my judgment a few years ago, I would do anything that I could to help that, because I felt that the world is so fragile and I do appeal to you quite sincerely that if some of you could find ways, and I'm sure we could be creative about it, to give help to the Secretary General in this quest to eliminate extreme poverty, I think we could make a major step forward together in accomplishing that. Thank you very much. Great. In the spirit of democracy, I'm going to ask your permission to let us stay to take just two questions. Is that okay? Here's the question. Just stand up, but I think it's, you can be loud enough. That's a nice voice. My name is Steve Terry. I've been chasing you for the last couple of weeks. I met you at the M Plaza Hotel in Accra, and I managed to give you my card and my brochure this morning. I work for a foundation that brings technology solutions to resource poor farmers. Goes to prove what you say that the technology does exist. That's not my question. My question is, while I agree with you that we're spending time explaining the deficiencies and the gaps and the deficits between what we need to address problems of the poor and what we're coming up with, we're spending time explaining that it's their fault. It is not their fault, but it may be the fault of some of their leaders. So we risk giving their leaders the wrong message if we do not emphasize that the malfeasance that they practice also contributes to the desperate situation. What do you tell those leaders in the quiet moments that you spend with them?
First, uh, I listen to them because I find one after the next that the insights that they have about the real situation within their countries is acute, important, and for me, extremely eye-opening. Prime Minister Mellis in Ethiopia gave me a three-hour lecture on development a couple of weeks ago that I found absolutely amazing. And I've heard a lot of lectures on development and given even more. So the first is to listen very carefully. Now, when I chose Senegal, Ghana, Kenya, and Ethiopia for this trip, I chose four well-governed countries. And Ghana is well-governed. There is no perfection for countries' uh, governance at $300 per capita, but sometimes we seem to be proving that when you reach 37,000, it only increases in scale the, uh, the levels of corruption uh, and, and abuse uh, at times. But I chose four countries where governance is not the issue, where the issue is poverty. There are other places in the world where governance is absolutely the issue. Despotic regimes, brutal, not only mismanaged, but managed on a personalistic basis. And those are not the countries that I went to. What absolutely alarms me, though, is that even when you have democratic good governance, we don't help those countries either. That's where my starting point is. I don't have a solution for the worst governed countries except to lead by example, to help the best governed countries. I do not want the United States turning out governments the way that it's been doing on some vision, mainly Mr. Cheney's, of who's to govern and who isn't. And what I would like to do is when President Wad of Senegal has a very clear idea about rural poverty in Senegal, and he says we need these technologies, and what he says makes sense, and how to get water management, water harvesting, uh, up into the arid sections of Senegal. He knows what he's talking about. That's who I want to help first. And when we're not doing that, that is the highest priority in the world. What we're going to do about the most miserably governed places, that's harder. Unfortunately, many of them are propped up by us. So uh, that's another, another part of the complicated story. But let's help the places that are ready to go now. Please. your local uh, public television is, and tell the American people, dig into your pockets, give a dollar, put it to the United Nations in the name of, of Kofi Amman, and that's the way you're going to alert Americans to the fact that the United Nations stands for something decent. Well, that's a very good idea. And if people would follow up uh, with some help and detailed suggestions, I'm easily reachable at sachs at columbia.edu. I can be found. My inbox is uh, very, very uh, avidly read by me. I uh, will read in the next five minutes, uh, and uh, I will be delighted to follow up with you. And I mean it seriously, but more than that, I really hope for it as well. I went from Addis to Stockholm a couple of weeks ago, and I carried with me a document from the Ministry of Health of Kenya. And it was the explanation of the missing $58 million, and I was in a room with all the donors. And I said, here it is, I, I said, it's a silent auction, I'll put the sheet out. Uh, you can all start bidding for the ones that uh, do this, and actually nobody signed. Nobody quite seriously came up to me and said, let's talk about it even. I don't give up so easily. I'm sending the leadership of the IMF, the World Bank, 
uh, and uh, all of the bilateral agencies, the letter, I, it may have gone out today or Monday with a detailed accounting of the crisis in Kenya, and I'll keep after them. But it's very hard to move this process, uh, and we have to keep fighting and finding clever ways to do this, and I appreciate your suggestion. I know from personal experience of riding airplanes with Jeffrey Sachs that, in fact, he is at all times connected to his BlackBerry. Um, so he means it. And if it's smarter, we may set up a 30-day blog with you. And that may be a smarter way oh, to great. make this conversation happen and uh, result in that's some wonderful. real action. So why don't we have that as our to-do list for the Global Philanthropy Forum? I, I just want to close, Jeffrey, by, no, I, I can't go without you. I uh, wanted to read my BlackBerry. Oh, actually, if you're going to read your BlackBerry, you can do no, that. No, it's okay. Um, we can innovate, and, and we can demonstrate, and we can advocate, we can champion causes, we can enable and empower institutions, every one of us. Um, we can demand leadership of our governments. We can demand leadership, show leadership ourselves locally um, in this room, in our we can reach out across sectors. Um, that's a lot easier and more important than sometimes we realize. We can create partnerships. We can identify and stick to strategies that work if we choose to. Um, I'm really grateful to everybody in this room um, and to Jeffrey and every other teacher in this room, because everyone here is in fact a teacher. Um, so thank you so much, Jeff. And